Good morning. It's good to see you here today. I'm thankful that you're here. Take your Bibles open to 3rd John. 3rd John, we'll look at verses 3 and 4. 3rd John is right before Revelation. So if you go to Revelation, back up, you'll find 3rd John. Only 15 verses in 3rd John. 3rd John's written to a disciple named Gaius from the Apostle John. He's writing to encourage him to be faithful, to walk in the truth. He includes in this brief letter how to treat strangers who come, how to show hospitality to those who are teaching truth. In former letters, he told how to treat those who are not teaching truth, but here he tells them how to teach, how to treat those who are teaching truth. Third John 3 and 4. Before we get in there, I want to remind you of a couple things. Don't forget, uh, on June 20th, if you look in your, on your sheet there, you'll see that it's South African night here at First Baptist Church. So we, besides being Father's Day, it's going to be South African night. And on that night, we're inviting all those who have come to our area from South Africa to help on farms and do different things to come and partake of a meal uh, in the gym. We're going to have a great meal for them. There's going to be testimony uh, from, uh, from South Africa. There's going to be testimony from one of our farmers. Uh, there's going to be um, uh, devotion. Uh, Brother Richard's going to tell how the Gideons are doing ministry in South Africa. It's going to be a great night. God has led a whole host of South Africans in our midst, and it is our job to minister to them and to show them the love of Christ. So I want what I need you to do, I need some of you to show up to serve, to help serve. I need some of you ladies or some of you men who cook good desserts to make some good desserts and bring those so that we'll have desserts for them. All right, that's June 20th. Don't forget to pray for our Southern Baptist Convention. We're in desperate need of prayer. There's lots going on in our convention, and I hate to say it's not all good. So, be in prayer for our convention as we meet beginning uh, next Sunday after, after church. I'll drive to Nashville and we'll participate in the Southern Baptist Convention. Also, this is just out there a little bit. We just finished our first semester, a pilot semester of a, of a uh, discipleship marriage study called Reengage. You may have heard of, of it. We... Uh, I had a desire, we the staff had a desire to uh, bring this study to our church. Uh, we went through the training and we had our first pilot semester. What that means is I chose some couples to go through that, asked them would they go through it, and they've gone through it so that we could learn what we're doing. We're going to offer this to all couples beginning in the fall in August. And uh, so I want you to start thinking about that. You say, well, my marriage is not in trouble. It's not just for marriages in trouble. It's for any marriage. There's no perfect marriage. We can all have better marriages. Right, Stacy? <laughs> she said, no, ours is perfect. So anyway, we can all have better marriages, and I think you'd benefit from this, so I want you to think about that and pay attention to the advertisements that are coming. All right, besides all that, next week, this week, tomorrow, we begin Vacation Bible School. This is a special week in the life of of our church. We've set aside a lot of money for Vacation Bible School. Many of you have volunteered to lead in Vacation Bible School. You can see direct decorations have been made and put up for Vacation Bible School. Tim and his leaders have planned and have a plan of execution. There will be more than 150 kids here each day, Monday through Friday, where they will play games and eat snacks and listen to Bible stories, and in general, learn about the Lord. Now, the question is, why do we do all that? Why do, why do people go to all the time and effort to make these decorations? Why do we set aside all that money? Why do people, people volunteer to lead in vacation Bible school? Surely, we hope the children have a, have a great time and have fun, but is that it? Well, there's more. The, the desire of Brother Tim, and I know of, of all of us on staff, and I pray the desire of our church is that children come 
They learn about the Lord God. They trust God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they begin a lifelong walk with Jesus. Salvation and continual sanctification. That is the goal. That's why we do this week every year. Now, I want you to open. Tim asked me for a title of my sermon every week. You don't always get these titles. But this week's title is Parent Goals. Parent Goals. Now, let's stand in honor of the Lord and His Word. And I want you to read 3 John 3 and 4. And then we're going to make some observations about it. Verse 3. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is, how you're walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in truth. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this special week in the life of our church. And Lord, it's my desire that as we prepare for this week and as we really think about our children participating and what the goal of this week is and, and Lord, maybe even what the goal of our lives are, I I pray that your word would speak to us. Lord, I have no power and no uh, sway really over men and women without the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit and your word, which is powerful, would speak to our hearts, convict us of righteousness, the things that we're doing right and the right way we're thinking, convict us of sin, uh, Lord, the things that are wrong in our lives, and change us and make us more like you. Make your goals our goals. And Lord, I Thank you again for the privilege of standing here, and I, I, I know my frailty, I know my sinfulness, and so I pray, Lord, this morning you'd protect me and you would use me, you'd speak through me, and I'll praise you for that. May you receive all glory, honor, and everything that's said, every thought that's had in this place today. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Let's begin at verse 3. The scripture says, I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is, how you are walking in truth. John says that brethren visited him. Now, he doesn't tell us who the brethren were. Don't tell us where they came from. Doesn't tell us how long they stayed. Anything like that. We, We don't know any of those things. But what we do know is they brought a good report. They came to him, and they, asked, they told him about Gaius. Now, I don't know how that conversation went. Maybe they came along, and they said, Hey, John, uh, do, you, do you know a guy named Gaius? He told us to tell you hello. Do you know him? You know, sometimes when someone approaches me or is introduced to me, and they find out that I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church of Rayville, they'll ask me something or else say something like, Do you know... So-and-so, you know Tim Hoytje, do you know Tyler Heath, do you know Mr. Jim Adams? And I have to admit, sometimes when they ask me, do I know someone, I wonder what's coming next. I just wonder what, it makes me a little nervous when they begin to talk. I never know what they're going to tell me, but I'm pleased to report that more often than not, after the conversation, I'm okay. But when they tell me what, what great people or what a great person it is that they ask me about or they tell me something kind that they did or they tell me something good that they've done or about their generosity or, or something like that, I got to tell you, it makes me feel really good. Not because I had anything to do with it or because I made someone do those things, but just because I'm associated with you. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to know that the Lord is doing something with you and that you're learning and growing and walking in the Lord. John was in the same position. The brethren came and they began to talk about Gaius and they gave a report to John 
And I, we don't even know what the report is, but this is what we do know. The report indicated that he was walking in the truth. Now, what does that mean? It means that the truth was in him. And it enabled him to walk with the Lord. In other words, somewhere along the road, and we're not privy to these circumstances or this information, but somewhere along the road, Gaius heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could have been from John. John may have shared the gospel with him. But he heard the gospel that he could be forgiven of his sins because God sent his, his one unique son, Jesus, to this earth to die on the cross for him, to be the once for all perfect sacrifice. And because of that perfect, holy blood that was shed, Gaius could be washed clean, that his sins could be washed away, that he could be forgiven, that he could come into a right relationship with God and walk with him on this earth, experience an abundant life, and then spend eternity with him in heaven. And when he heard that gospel, he trusted Christ for salvation. And after he trusted Christ, the, the truth came into him. And, and Gaius didn't stop there, but he read the word. And he meditated on the Word. And he delighted in the Word. And then he put the Word into practice in his daily life. It was not just enough to hear the Word, but he, he took the Word in. And he walked in the truth. It's clear that his life was wrapped up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a follower, a follower of Christ, and he was walking in the truth. Isn't that great? Well, great's not a good enough word, really. Isn't that glorious to hear a report like that? Gaius came to Christ, and he didn't turn back. He didn't hesitate. He was found faithful. He was found to be walking in the truth, walking with Christ according to his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, that's our goal. I should say that's my goal. I hope it's your goal. Is that your goal? Well, let me ask it a little bit more pointedly. If someone comes to, to someone you know or goes to someone you know and they give a report of your life, would they give the same report of your life that they gave of Gaius? Would they go to your friend or your loved one and say, hey, do you know so-and-so? I met them. I've, I've been living with, around them for the last year. And do you know he or she really walks with the Lord? They don't just claim the name of Christ, but each day as they go out, they live with Christ. They take his word seriously and they walk in the truth. Would that be the description of your life? Let me say this. When you bow your head and, and you call on the name of the Lord Jesus to save you and to forgive you of your sins, and you take on that name Christian, that's what you declare your goal is to be. A little Christ, one who walks after Christ, one who is marked by the blood of Christ and who is different because of the blood of Christ. You won't find in this scripture anywhere where he calls someone to salvation and then calls them just to go back and live just like you did before you knew Christ or go and live like the rest of the world. No, he calls you to live like Christ. And so listen, I want you to listen close. If, if, you, if you're in this place and you name the name of Christ, but as I've asked these questions, you have to honestly look at yourself and say, you know what, if someone went to my relatives that live somewhere else or to a friend of mine that lives somewhere else and they began to describe my life, it would not be that I am walking in the truth. Then something is wrong. And it's not the Bible that's wrong. It's not the preacher that's wrong. It's not your Sunday school teacher that's wrong. But somewhere along the way, you've stepped away from the truth. The great news is this. If you know Christ and somehow sin has crept in your life and got a stronghold, 
The scripture says if you'll confess your sin to him that he is faithful and righteous and he will forgive you of your sins and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so I encourage you, turn back to him. Turn back and trust him and, and, and be that one who people say, boy, he or she really walks in the truth. But more, that's our goal this week. We will unashamedly and intentionally share the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of sins through Jesus with these children. Each day, our focus will be to share the gospel, to share with them truth of scriptures each day, that they would come to a knowledge of the truth, that they would come to trust in Jesus Christ, that they would begin a walk with Jesus Christ that would not end, that would not rust, that would not fade, but that will last all eternity and that will inform their lives from the day they meet him to the day they go to be with him. They'll walk in his truth. That's our, that's our goal. But look at verse 4. John wrote, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. John said, I have, I have no greater joy than this. Now, that's something. The, the, there was nothing in his life that made him happier. The word joy here in, in this context is an emotion of great happiness, of pleasure. We could say delight. John indicated that there was nothing in his life, nothing that he experienced, nothing that he had that gave him greater pleasure or delight than to hear of one of his children walking in the faith, walking in the truth. Now, it said one of his children. Now, Gaius was not his little child. Maybe John led him to the Lord. Maybe John mentored him. Maybe he discipled him, whatever it was. But they had a, a relationship where John felt like he was one of his. And he says, I have, there's nothing that makes me happier than to hear of one of mine walking in the truth, walking faithfully after Jesus Christ. You know, this week we will have many children here, and they're, and they're they're our children. Church, I want you to listen to me. They're our, they are our children. God has brought your children here. He will bring other children here. And understand, you and I have a great responsibility to the children that God brings into our midst. We have, an oper we have the responsibility to teach them the Word. We have the responsibility to model before them the Word of God. We have the, the responsibility to make sure that their doctrine is, is correct. We, need, we have the responsibility to make sure that they grow up with right theology. And I'm afraid that many who, who are a part of the body of Christ don't recognize or don't take the responsibility that we have to our children seriously. But we have a great responsibility, and that's our responsibility. And, and, and that, that, is, that should be what delights us. Let me ask you this question. I want to press in and make this a little more personal. What is it that brings you the most delight about your children? What makes you happy about your children? Was it your child went three for four at the plate over the week? Had a double that chased in a run that won the game? Nothing better than that. Maybe he pitched a complete game and, or she pitched a complete game, struck out 19 of the batters she, he, she or he faced, and boy, nobody could touch them. And man, that makes me happy. That gets me pumped. I'm excited about that. Maybe it's report cards. All that ball stuff is foolishness, and, and you're serious about academics, and praise God, your child 
is on the dean's list, on the principal's list, whatever list it is. I, don't, I never had one of those lists, so don't contend. I don't know what they are. Anyway, that's what it's all about for you. Your child's making straight A's, and they're top of their class, and they're going to do this and that. But, man, everybody knows that they're making straight A's. And when you hear that, it delights your soul. Perhaps your children are older, professionals. They make a great living. And you look at that, and, man, you see how much money they're making and all the things they're doing, all the stuff they have. And, man, that just, man, that excites your soul. You are, you, it makes you happy. You brought them up to work hard, and now they've made it, and they're making more than you ever dreamed of making. And, and you just can't stand it. You're so happy about it. Or it could be beauty. I mean, you look at your child, and you step back, and you look at him again, and you say, my goodness, that is the most beautiful child I have ever seen in my life. And you do everything you can to make sure they're the most beautiful child that anybody else sees in their entire life. You get them all the right clothes and, and do all, fix all their hair the right way and all this kind of stuff and the latest fashions, and you are thrilled at the way they look and how people love to look at them. Are those things bad? Oh, they're, they're not bad. I, you know, I want my children to thrive in all they do. If they pl play ball, I want them to play hard and I want them to play well. They better make good grades because I told them, Daddy ain't got no money to send you to college. If you want to go, you better make good grades. I want them to work hard and and my goodness, I'm grateful that my children are prettier than their daddy. <laughs> but what should our goal be? Our goal and the thing that should bring us the greatest delight is, is not three-pointers made. It's not lists because of academics. We should do everything we can to ensure that our children walk after the Lord. That should be our primary goal. My goal with my children shouldn't be to make sure that they get a, the, a scholarship so they can go to college. I should be more intense and more intentional about making sure they know the Word of God and that they're reading the Word of God and that they're walking with the Lord. My goal shouldn't be that, that they're the, the best athletes. I, I've got to tell you this, and, and you know, I love athletics, but I've got to tell you this. Our, our society, and I say this every so often, so just bear with me and you just listen to it again. Our society has made sports a God. And we spend more time and more resources and more effort on making our children good at some sport than we ever thought about spending making sure that they know the Word of God. I got to tell you something. When your child gets to be 75 and is laying in the hospital because they had a heart attack, it ain't going to make a difference if they, if they hit a grand slam to win the state tournament or if they shot a three-pointer at the buzzer to win the game. The only thing that's going to matter in those moments is if that child knew the truth and trusted Jesus and walked in his ways. It's not going to matter it's not going to matter if they got an academic scholarship to Vanderbilt. It's not going to matter how much money they made in their career or how hard they worked. But what is going to matter is if, if they knew Jesus Christ as their Savior and walked in His grace. Paul, I mean, John said, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children 
walking in the truth. His life was built around leading others to Christ and helping others walk after Christ. Let me tell you something, guys, y'all who have children, man, I hope you have a, a great life. I hope you do, do a lot of great stuff and fun stuff, but let me tell you something. Don't neglect the Word of God. Don't put anything ahead of the Word of God. Don't, let's, let's make a covenant together that we're going we're gonna to do everything we can to teach our children the Word of God, and that's going to be the emphasis of our parenthood, not that's going to be the goal of our parenthood. Not all this other stuff, though. All that stuff is good, and it needs some emphasis. But the, the major goal of our life as we raise our children will be to lead them to walk after Christ. 